Good afternoon, I'm not your usual MC, I'm Tom Segru, and I am the director of the Penn Social Science and Policy Forum, which is a university-wide initiative to bring together policy-relevant social scientists, faculty, students, and so forth. Um, this year's theme for the Social Science and Policy Forum is Poverty and Opportunity. Um, hence, we took advantage of the opportunity uh, to collaborate with the sociology department to bring Dave Brady here uh, to speak about his cutting-edge work. David Brady is the director of the Inequality and Social Policy Research Unit at the WZB Berlin Social Research Center. He studies poverty and inequality, social policy, politics, work, and labor, and research methods. Um, after earning his PhD uh, in, at the University of Indiana in 2001, uh, he taught for uh, nearly a decade at Duke University, um, where he wrote Rich Democracies, Poor People, How Politics Explain Poverty. He's also uh, co-editor co with another Duke professor, Linda Burton, of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of social, the Social Science of Poverty. He's author of many, many articles in almost every major journal in sociology, including, I think, three in the ASR, um, including most recently, Does Immigration Undermine Public Support for Social Policy, which appeared um, this year in the American Sociological Review. He's also um, author, most recently, of The Rise and Fall of Government Spending in Affluent Democracies in the Journal of European Social Policy. His approach to the topic is very much global, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Okay, so it's the 50th year anniversary of the War on Poverty, and as I was joking with Tom, we were all benefiting from the insights and the wisdoms of great poverty scholars like Paul Ryan this past year, and in the discussion that emerged from that, Michael Tanner from the Cato Institute tells us we have a pretty good idea of how to get out of poverty and how to stay out of poverty. Number one is finish school. Number two is if you're a woman you're not, and you're not married, don't have a baby. And number three is jobs. About 10 years before that, the noted poverty scholar Isabel Sawhill wrote, those who graduate from high school, wait until marriage to have children, limit the size of their families, and work full time will not be poor. About 20 years before Sawhill, in arguably the most influential book on poverty of the past half century, William Julius Wilson tells us that blacks, especially young males, are dropping out of the labor force in significant numbers. The rise of female-headed families has had dire social and economic consequences because these families are far more vulnerable to poverty than other types of families. And more than a century before Sawhill, in perhaps the most influential book about Philadelphia, W. E. B. Du Bois grounded his explanation of poverty very much within a history of slavery and racism. Nevertheless, he wrote, the very large number of the widowed and separated points to grave physical, economic, and moral disorder. The great weakness of the Negro family is still lack of respect for the marriage bond, inconsiderate entrance into it, and bad household economy and family government. Sexual looseness then arises as a secondary consequence. Now, as illustrated by these quotes, a focus on the demographic risks of poverty has been almost a timeless focus of individualist poverty research. Okay, and so I throw a whole bunch of references up there, including Matthew, just sitting right there, you can blame him. Um, and this is something that continues to be studied. It was studied historically. You can find it in poverty scholarship throughout the 20th century. And still to this day, a robust tradition of research tries to focus on identifying the individual demographic characteristics that distinguish the poor from the non-poor. So this is very much part of poverty research. Now, a number of us have critiqued this individualist explanation of poverty. So one of my intellectual heroes, Michael Katz, tells us, the idea that poverty is a problem of persons, that is, it results from moral, cultural, or biological inadequacies, has dominated discussions for well over 200 years, and has given us the enduring idea of the undeserving poor. So, despite the fact that there are critiques of these sorts of individualist explanations of poverty, despite the fact that there's been enormous research already done on the demographic risks of poverty, I see absolutely no decline occurring in the interest in the demographic risks of poverty. And so my view is that there may be problems, there may be strengths or weaknesses of these explanations ranging from Michael Tanner all the way back to W.E.B. Du Bois, but there's no abatement in the interest in the demographic risks of poverty. So what I want to do today is try to articulate perhaps a more effective strategy for understanding and analyzing the demographic risks of poverty. So our principal goal is to see if we can develop a framework for better understanding these demographic risks so long as people are going to continue to study them. So along with that aim for the talk, developing this framework for better understanding the demographic risks of poverty, we're going to do a few other things in the talk today, and let's just go through those quickly. First of all, like I said, offer this framework. 
Secondly, we're going to descriptively compare the variation in the two aspects of the demographic risk of poverty. So I'm going to argue there are really two elements to the demographic risk of poverty. Third, we're going to investigate whether or not these demographic risks, and specifically those two aspects, can explain the classic question of why does the United States have so much poverty. Fourth, we're going to examine the relationship between these two aspects of the demographic risk. And fifth and finally, we're going to analyze why the more salient of those two aspects varies cross section. Okay, so that's the plan for the talk. So let's move right on to start talking about this framework that we want to sort of develop for understanding the demographic risk of poverty. Okay, we're going to argue there are two elements to the demographic risk of poverty, prevalences and penalties. Okay, we can break it up into that. So let's explain what each of those is. First of all, a prevalence is simply the share of the population with a given, given demographic risk. So we can talk about a certain percentage of the working age population that lives in single mother households, a certain percentage is an unemployed household, a certain percentage is low educated and so forth. Very straightforward, very obvious in that sense. The other element we're going to call is the penalties. And we're going to define this as the increased probability of poverty that is associated with a given demographic risk. So if you carry one of these demographic risks, how much does it increase your probability of poverty? And we're going to specifically suggest that to measure these penalties, it requires at least three criteria. First, the penalties should be comparable across contexts. So we want to come up with some sort of metric that allows us to make at least descriptive comparisons, if not uh, strong inferential comparisons, about the differences in penalties across different contexts. Secondly, the penalty for a given demographic risk should be conditional on other demographic risks and a reasonable set of other observables. Now this guards against conflating the penalty of one demographic risk with another. So for example, if we're going to suggest that being a single mother has a certain penalty, we want to be sure, at least on a basic level, it's not conflated with the low education levels or low employment levels that single mother households might carry. And third, penalties should be concordant such that an increased penalty should lead to a concordant increased probability of poverty. Now in an ideal world, the measurement of these penalties would also be causal. However, in the data, including many different countries, and especially the data used by most social scientists, that's simply not possible. Okay, so we're going to return to this issue in the conclusion today, and I want to speculate about what it might mean if we had causal evidence on these penalties. But for our purposes, we're, not, we're going to punt on the, on the issue of whether or not these penalties are causal. Okay, so we can debate whether or not, in fact, single motherhood has a causal effect on poverty. We just want to come up with a reasonable estimate of how this penalty exists. Now, regardless of whether you're interested in penalties or prevalences, there's broad consensus in the literature that there are really, I already said this, okay? And there are, there's broad consensus in the literature that there's four demographic risks that are most salient to poverty. Single parenthood, low employment, or unemployment, low education, and young headship. Okay, so these are the ones that the literature seems to agree are the key demographic factors that predict poverty, okay? Uh, even though the literature almost never has almost ever is too strong, most of the time the literature doesn't have causal evidence on this. I think we might even be able to agree yeah. that there might be causal effects of these demographic risks for poverty. But nevertheless, um, there's not real debate in the literature about whether these demographic risks are salient. Everybody seems to agree these are the key four ones that we should be paying attention to. All right, so I alluded to a whole bunch of citations. I gave you some classic quotes that these demographic lists are in the risks are in the poverty literature. I'd also like to ground our understanding of how these topics are studied by looking at four literature that are prominent in American poverty research and just discuss and review how they study the demographic risk to give us some, some sense of how people typically work with these demographic risks. Okay, one of the most productive literatures that emerged in, say, the past 20 years was the literature that grew out of the 1996 U.S. welfare reform. So in this literature, many scholars argue that welfare reform was successful because it encouraged employment and it reduced young headship and single motherhood, and a number of studies have shown this. So for example, the famous economist Robert Moffat tells us the great transformation of the welfare system set off by state reforms in the early 1990s and by the 1996 welfare reform law had as its primary focus the encouragement of work by mothers on welfare. This goal has been achieved to a much greater degree than anyone expected, but very much implicit in this literature has been a concern with demographic risk. We need to discourage the non-employment of single mothers. We need to discourage single mothers. We need to encourage later headship rather than young headship. And we need to encourage education of these people as opposed to having children. So this has been a strong theme in this literature. 
Now, influenced by William Gillis Wilson, the neighborhood effects literature also was really focused on demographic risk. So many, many scholars would predict the education, the single motherhood, or the unemployment of individuals based on the neighborhood in which they grew up. And so there was lots of studies that showed if you grew up in a poor neighborhood, you're more likely to become a single mother, you're less likely to become employed, you're more likely to become a young head, and so forth. Many have argued this is how poverty gets reproduced, is through these demographic risks. Also, Scholars will often, often measure neighborhood disadvantage with an index or a scale of demographic risk. So neighborhoods that have a lot of single motherhood or perhaps have a low education, we can say these are poor disadvantaged neighborhoods. So everybody agrees, demographic risks are part of that story. As one example of this, Ladd and Ludwig, for example, showed us that in the Moving to Opportunity study, relocation of people to less poor neighborhoods improves adolescent educational outcomes. That was one of the key outcomes, was that we could reduce the risk of low education by moving people out of poor neighborhoods. Now perhaps the most, maybe even the most productive poverty literature of the past 10, 15 years has been the fragile families literature. Now this literature has been singularly focused on the question of why low-income mothers and fathers fail to get married. And any number of studies growing out of that literature is focused on that very question. So Sarah McClanahan, reviewing that literature, including her own, argues to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty, we will need to find a way to persuade young women from disadvantaged backgrounds that delaying fertility while they search for a suitable partner will have a payoff that is large enough to offset the loss of time spent as a mother or the possibility of foregoing motherhood entirely. And last but not least, in the last few years, we've seen a resurgence of interest on new cultural explanations of poverty. All right? And this literature is more nuanced than older cultural explanations of poverty, but at the end of the day, they basically make the same argument. And they argue that culture explains poor people's behavior, and as a result of that behavior, poor people are more likely to be in these demographic risk categories. They're more likely to be low educated, more likely to be single mothers, and what have you. And because of that demographic risk, you see more reproduction of them. Okay, so this is implicit, this is explicit within this literature. Uh, so, for example, Dave Hardy shows us that if you grow up in a poor neighborhood, the cultural heterogeneity of mixed messages and signals that you get as an adolescent male is going to affect your sexual behavior, and thus this is going to lead to more single motherhood, and that's important because that's a demographic risk of poverty. Steve Vasey tells us that the low educational aspirations of youth is going to influence their educational achievement, and that's important because it leads to low education and unemployment, both key demographic risks of poverty. Okay? So in four of the most prominent poverty literatures that are working today, some of the most productive scholars, many of the most influential studies that have been done on poverty, you see a great deal of interest in demographic risks of poverty still to this day. Now despite what I would say are very salient contributions from these literatures, there are a number of limitations to how poverty is studying, or scholars are studying demographic risks of poverty. And I want to highlight specifically four major limitations that we hope to address. First, if you look across this literature, it's overwhelmingly focused on the prevalences of demographic risk with relatively little attention to the penalties attached to a given demographic risk. So many, many scholars you saw are very interested in reducing the prevalence of these demographic risks and not asking questions about why the penalties might vary across time or across context or what have you. Secondly, even though a few scholars have made attempts to do so, and you see some simulations like this, it's actually quite unclear if realistic counterfactual simulations would make a major difference to poverty. So even if we could reduce the prevalence of demographic risk, even if we could push single motherhood back to what it was in 1970 or 1980, it's not actually clear how big of a dent in poverty this would make, despite a few attempts to do so. Now, as a result of these first two points, we simply have no clue how big of a difference the penalties make. Maybe that's too strong. We don't really know. I don't know if we have a clue of that. Okay? But we don't really have a good understanding. Although scholars have tried to do simulations on the first point about moving around with the prevalences, very little research has tried to sort of sort out how big of a difference the penalties make. And so we don't really know how big of a dent it would make if you could counterfactually manipulate the penalties. Okay. Fourth and finally, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of the literature studies only the United States. Okay, now this is telling because we don't really ever consider if the United States is unusual or unrepresentative. We don't have a sense of how the United States stands relative to other rich democracies, not necessarily on poverty, but certainly on this question of demographic risks. 
the implication of that is that we have almost no attention to the unusual political and institutional context of the United States, and we're not really studying variation in penalties because we're only studying one context. So we can only really observe the penalties as they exist within the United States. Okay. So our view is that we need to move this literature forward by trying to address these four limitations. Now let's move to the first empirical part of the talk and talk just briefly about some of the data and so forth that we'll analyze. Okay, we're gonna use the Luxembourg Eden study. If you're not familiar with it, what it is is a cross-national archive where they take individual level, nationally representative data sets, they sort of pull it together, they harmonize, they clean it up, they try to make it almost standardized across these different countries. We're gonna use data on 29 high-income democracies. We take all the high-income countries except Russia because it's not democratic, and we have to also throw out Australia because their education data isn't really usable in this sense. Okay, so we have 29 countries. We include all people in households with a head of household that is less than 65 years old. Okay? And by this, we're sort of thinking of what I'll call working-age households. Now, demographic risk also matter to elderly poverty, and I've written elsewhere that elderly poverty is much worse than conventional wisdom would suggest. Nevertheless, the, the demographic challenges of elderly poverty are really a different set of processes than those for the working age, so we're only concentrating on the working age here today. And our samples range across countries. The smallest sample we have about 3,600 cases from Hungary. We have 400,000 cases from Norway. For the United States, the list sample is the current population survey, so we have about 180,000 cases. But most of these countries give us enough variation, enough cases. Each of the demographic risk cells are big enough that we can usually say something pretty meaningful about what it's like to be, for example, a single mother in these different countries. Now our definition of poverty is grounded in the measure of minimum household income as disposable household income. And by this, we incorporate information on taxes and transfers, okay? And this is really different from how American poverty researchers typically measure poverty, okay? We also adjust for household size with an equivalization of the square root of household numbers. Our definition of poverty is the classic relative measure of poverty, which is less than 50% of median household income, equivalized disposable as well. Um, by using this measure, it's less common in the United States, but it is by far, by far, the standard way to measure poverty in international poverty research. And I'll, I'll be happy to discuss in Q&A if you want why I think this is vastly superior than, say, for example, the official measure. All right, but suffice to say, we're following international convention today. The measurement of prevalence is very straightforward. We simply take the population weighted mean of the sample on these binary variables. So we simply are saying what percent of working age population. Again, the unit of analysis is individuals. So these are individuals nested in households. Everybody in a household led by a single mother counts as a single mother individual according to this data. Okay, so it's very simply what percent of the population has a given demographic risk. The measurement of penalty is a little bit more complicated. What we do is we estimate linear probability models for each of the 29 countries. Okay, and I can talk in Q&A about why we, we use linear probability as opposed to logic. It goes back to those issues of comparability, conditionality, and concordance, and the challenges that exist when working with simulations, but also trying to find metrics that are relatively comparable across different samples and across different uh, models. And our model includes a whole bunch of demographic characteristics. All right, and let me just focus on the underlying ones, which are the ones that measure whether or not somebody, the, the key demographic risks we're interested in. Okay, so for a young head, that means that you are a member of a household where the head of the household is less than 25 years old. All right, you're a single mother individual if you live in a household that's single mother in reference to these other categories. All right, you're low education if you have less than a secondary degree, so less than a high school degree in the United States, and this is an international standardized classification of education. All right, so it mostly reflects the lack of secondary degree. Unemployment is that no one is employed in the household, so it's really non-employment as opposed to unemployment. All right, and that's opposed to one or multiple earners. All right, to address the fact that we have a binary dependent variable, we robust, uh, we correct the standard errors. We also cluster the standard errors because we have individuals, multiple individuals in some households and some countries. Okay, all right. So that's how we measure the penalties. That's how we measure the prevalences. To give you a sense of what this looks like, here's the model for the United States. Okay, so this is a linear probability model. The coefficients are very easy to read because they're a linear probability model. So we can say, for example, being in an unemployed household increases your probability of poverty by about 
okay? That's the biggest penalty. The next biggest penalty is young headship, which increased your probability of poverty by about 0.22, followed by low education. And despite the fact that the literature predominantly focuses on this, single motherhood actually has the smallest penalty of the four demographic risks, and it's considerably smaller than the penalty attached to being, for example, in an unemployed household. And we control, so we're conditioning on all these other variables here, and you can see, so we're adjusting for those variables and hoping to, at least on some level, not conflate these demographic risks with the other obvious observables. So again, evidence is not causal, but it gives us some sense of the conditional association between these risks and poverty. Okay, so let's move on to talk about the variation in the prevalences and penalties across countries. So the, the simple question is we want to try to understand how much do these prevalences and penalties vary across demographic risks, okay? And I'm gonna show you kind of a busy figure, but it's not that bad once I walk you through it, so don't freak out. All right, so a little busy. All right, so what we have here, on the four rows are each of the four demographic risks across the x-axis or the 29 different countries. On the y-axis is that penalty, or excuse me, the prevalence. Okay, so that's the percent of the population that lives in one of these demographic risks. So let's take the easiest one, the single motherhood one, and you can see, for example, that in Australia, about 6% of the population is in a single mother household. And again, when I say population, just bear with me, I'm referring to the working age population. Okay? Now, yeah. Does that include people who are cohabitating but not married? It does not, it, it does not necessarily include them. Okay, so there, this, is, there, this is just this single is mothers. A, Female-headed household, okay, where uh, the female is between the ages of 18 and 54, okay, there are children present and the head is not married, okay. So if there's now in most of the European data sets, if they're cohabiting, they're probably going to be coded as married. Usually in the list they code the cohabitors, especially the long-term cohabitors, because in Europe that's functionally equivalent for the most part. Okay. I know we have a lot of demographers here, so I'll be a little, a little careless to say that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to this real simply. What the, the key punchline here is just to see how much comparative variation there is in this prevalence across countries. So some countries have small percentage of their population. For example, Greece, Hungary, Slovenia, Slovakia have a relatively low prevalence of single motherhood within their country. So other countries, for example, probably most notably Ireland and the United Kingdom have a relatively high prevalence of single motherhood across these different countries. And you see lots of variation. So there's, you know, some countries have a lot of one demographic risk, whereas on a different demographic risk, maybe their prevalence is relatively high. So Spain is relatively low in single motherhood, but for example, it's quite high on low education. Spain has a huge share of its population where people don't have a secondary degree. Okay, so lots of variation between countries, lots of variation between different demographic risks, Okay, and there's just a lot of heterogeneity. So in fact, there is substantial, meaningful variation in the prevalence of demographic risks across countries. Now another way to visualize this is to add up the demographic risks. And this figure shows you, do you have one, two, three, and four demographic risks? And you can see Spain across the top, they have a large share of their population with at least one demographic risk. And it, like I just showed you, in the Spanish case, that big bar of one, is driven principally by the large share of the population with low education, okay? Now, you can see a couple things here that are worth noting. First of all, the United States is relatively low on the prevalence of demographic risk. A very small share, only about 25% of the U.S. population has at least one demographic risk, okay? So it's not that prevalent. You could say arguably, just counting up the number of demographic risks that you're carrying, the United States sits below average relative to many other countries. We don't have this huge share of our population with low education like Spain does, or Italy does, okay? And moreover, a really key thing to emphasize is that it's incredibly rare for somebody to have four demographic risks. So think of this, what this means in the United States. You're a single mother that's low educated, that's not employed, and you're young, all right? To me, this seems like sort of the stereotypical group of people that American poverty researchers study, all right? But in fact, this group is so small, they don't even show up on my figure. I couldn't get the little black bar for four risks to even show up. The only country that even shows up is Ireland because it's such a small, small prevalence within the population. So I think this is important to stress because any number of American poverty researchers like to go to the poorest neighborhood or the most disadvantaged people they can find perhaps in West Philadelphia or Camden, New Jersey, and study the choices that these disadvantaged peoples are making. 
And my question would be, well, you know, if you look at the data, it's extremely unusual that you would be in this category. It's extremely unusual. So we should ask ourselves whether we can generalize from this extremely unusual population of people that have these four risks that you can't even really see because that little black bar is so small it doesn't even show up in statement. All right? So it's, it's, a, it's a tough question to think about these highly vulnerable people that carry a lot of demographic risks. All right, so there's lots of variation of penalties across, or prevalence across countries. Let's look at penalties with a similar figure, also quite busy. All right, x-axis, 29 countries, four demographic risks. The y-axis now is the increased probability of poverty associated with a given demographic risk. Okay, so let's look at the single motherhood one. Um, and for example, you can take, let's just take Canada right there. We're saying basically with Canada, that being in a single mother household, conditional on all of those other variables, increases your probability of poverty by about seven or eight percent. Okay, that's roughly what we're saying. Now, if it's black, it's statistically significant. If it's hollow, it's not significantly different from zero. So we should be clear and careful to stress that in fact those penalties for many of these countries are not significantly different from, from zero. Indeed, in a majority of the countries, we cannot identify a significant uh, penalty attached to single motherhood conditional on all these other variables. So in many, many countries, a majority, being a single mother household is not indeed statistically significantly associated with an increased probability of poverty, okay? Nevertheless, like with prevalence, we see a great deal of variation across countries. Enormous heterogeneity. Some countries, single mothers are dramatically more likely to be poor relative to, to non-single mothers. So for example, in countries like Germany, uh, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and especially the United States, the penalty attached to single motherhood is very, very steep. It's a very, very strong increased probability of poverty. By contrast, in many countries, it's not significantly different from zero. There's a bunch of countries that cluster near zero. And for a few countries, Denmark and Norway, for example, there's actually a significant advantage to being a single mother because the benefits are so good, they're actually significantly less likely to be poor, net of all these observable characteristics, okay? So again, we observe lots of heterogeneity. Again, we observe also heterogeneity between the demographic risks. So a country, for example, like, I don't know, let's take uh, Sweden, relatively high penalty for young headship, but quite a low penalty for single motherhood, uh, low education, and unemployment. So there's variation across risk, across countries, what have you. Now the way to add this up is a little simpler because these are mutually exclusive, whereas the prevalences are not mutually exclusive. We can just say, well, how much penalties are attached to all four of these risks if you add them up? And we can visualize what that looks like. And what we see here is a couple different things. First of all, the United States stands out for having by far the biggest penalties attached to these demographic risks far higher than any other country. There's a lot of variation across countries, okay? And so this is basically saying that if you carry each of these four demographic risks in the United States, we're saying you're almost 100% likely to be poor. Now it's a little tricky, but nevertheless, that's a, a simplistic way to stylize the fact. All right, I quoted Sawhill at the beginning for saying, those who graduate from high school, wait until marriage to have children, limit the size of their families and work full time and will not be poor. However, it's more accurate to say those who do not graduate from high school, who have children out of marriage, have low education, and do not work, will be poor. Okay? We can almost see that as almost a certitude, if you will. Admittedly, a little flimsy with the statistics there. Okay. But really, it's only in the United States. Only in the United States do you see such a strong penalty attached to these demographic risks. In some countries, you can see there's those significant or insignificant uh, advantages attached to these demographic risks because they're not actually more likely to be poor. And you can see there's lots of variation across these countries. If you have all four of these demographic risks in Luxembourg, for example, your increased probability of poverty is only about 25% higher than somebody who doesn't have any of these demographic risks. So lots of cross-national variation. Now one of the ways to summarize this is to take all these patterns and prevalences, treat them as a country level variable, and then look at the coefficients of variation. Okay, so we want to say how much variation is there? All right, and this simply tells you, is there more variation than prevalences or penalties? And what we find is that three of the four demographic risks, unemployment being the sole exception, the variation between countries and penalties is bigger than the variation between prevalences, okay? So in other words, in single motherhood, for example, there's more than twice as much variation in the penalty attached to single motherhood as there in the, is in the prevalence of single motherhood. We also see larger variation in young headship and low education. And so we would suggest, with the exception of unemployment, which is basically on parity, the prevalences and penalties vary similarly across countries. With the exception of unemployment, there's more variation in penalties than prevalences. Okay? Much more variation. Now from that point, I would argue that that 
greater variation that exists in penalties and prevalences on its face would suggest penalties are more important than prevalences. Okay, I would say, you know, we can say, look, there's just more variation. There's not as much variation in prevalences. There's more variation in penalties. But as an actual test of this hypothesis, or claim, conjecture, I'm now going to apply this framework of thinking about prevalences and penalties to the classic question of poverty research of why it is the United States has so much poverty. Okay, so I'm gonna first just conjecture. There's more variation than penalties, than prevalences. I'm gonna say penalties are more important, but now let's actually test that. Is it in fact the case that penalties matter more to that meaningful cross-national variation of poverty? Okay, so just as a quick review, as Tom alluded to for a long time, I've been studying the amount of poverty across rich democracies. What this is is a kernel density graph, which shows you the distribution of poverty across rich democracies. And you can see sort of the typical country in my sample has about 9% of its population poor. And as my book says, and I probably repeated ad nauseum, the United States has a lot of poverty. Okay, not a shocking thing. You're sort of sampling on the dependent variable when you study the United States, because the U.S. is sort of an extreme end of the distribution where poverty is quite common, it's quite prevalent, if you will. Okay, and for a long time I've had this nice little story that I like to tell that the United States has the most inequality, the most poverty in the rich democracies, and it was a, a nice rhetorical foil. Unfortunately, Israel has been messing with my story. <laughs> they decided the past 10 years to boost their poverty. They went to the championships. They're not poverty. <laughs> And in fact, there's a lot of great research that can be done on trying to understand what the heck happened to Israel. Uh, a friend of mine, Asaf Lebanon, is trying to build a national poverty center in Israel to make sense of what's going on in Israel. Because it really is since about 2000 that Israel sort of skyrockets to the top of the ratings, and they now actually have more poverty than the United States. Nevertheless, my story still sort of works, I would say. The U.S. still has a lot of poverty. It's unusually high in terms of its poverty, much more than most of the other rich democracies that exist across the, the affluent world. So let's compare where the U.S. sits in terms of prevalences and penalties, okay? So the U.S. has unusually high poverty, if not the highest, but unusually high nevertheless, but it has below average prevalences, okay? So the United States is a little bit below average, and what I do here is I just sum the prevalences. Okay, and that's a little bit sketchy because they're not mutually exclusive, but just for the sake of argument, bear with me. All right, and just to visualize what it looks like, if you add up the prevalences, you see the United States is slightly below average. Not dramatically below average, but slightly below average in the prevalence of these demographic risks. You could say, well, we have a lot of single motherhood. We have a relatively small share of our population that has low education. We have a relatively small share of our population that has young headship. So compared to most other rich democracies, the U.S. doesn't stand out as exceptional or unusual in terms of the prevalence of demographic risks. Okay, so it has relatively high poverty, below average prevalences, but extremely high penalties. Okay, so this is the kernel density on penalties. And the United States, as I showed you earlier, you're almost 100% probability of being poor if you carry all four demographic risks. I think what's also telling is that the second highest country is dramatically below the United States. So Japan has the second highest penalties added up together, but that's a sizable gap. So in Japan, if you have all four demographic risks, maybe 75% increased probability of being poor, whereas the United States is basically 100%. So what makes the United States really stand out is not its prevalences, but its high, high penalties, okay? So what we did to work with this is we said, well, let's go back to that linear probability model that we estimated. And we said, well, what if we counterfactually manipulated that? What if we gave the United States in this linear probability model, what if we gave it the prevalences of the median country? What if we gave it the penalty of the median country? And then we simulated what would happen to American poverty if you could counterfactually manipulate it that way. And what do we find? Well, first of all, if you gave the United States cross-national median prevalences, it would make almost no, it would make no difference to poverty. And you see this up here at the top. Okay, if we give them for all four risk groups, poverty would actually be higher in the United States. So if the United States converged on cross-national median prevalences of demographic risk, we'd be worse off. Okay, and that's because we don't actually have that many people with low education or that many people with young headship. We would see a tiny reduction in poverty. I don't know if that's statistically significant, but whatever. All right, <laughs> we'd see a tiny reduction in poverty with a cross-national median single motherhood rate. Okay, okay, that's something. That's a very small difference. It would go from about 17% to what, I don't know, 16, 16.5%. It would still be the second highest poverty level of any British democracy. If we had similar cross-national medians on low education or unemployment, Americans would have worse poverty. 
Okay, on penalties, we do see a little bit of progress. If the United States had cross-national medians on all, four on all four penalties, our poverty rates would maybe be about 12%. So countries like Spain and Italy would have higher poverty than the United States, and certainly Israel as well. And you can see we see a modest reduction in all four of those, or each, each of those four penalties, okay? So well, you can read this two ways. You could say, well, even if you manipulate all four penalties, poverty doesn't decline dramatically. That's true, because demographic risks don't make as big of a difference as people like to imagine. Okay, but nevertheless, you see no progress if we got to cross-national median prevalences, and some progress if you had cross-national median penalties. Okay, now one other counterfactual that a lot of people like to do is they like to ask historically, what if we could turn back the clock to those glorious days? You know, when women were subjugated to men, that was great, man. <laughs> low divorce rates and, you know, uh, high low education rates, racial segregation, that was great in the 1970s. Man, it was awesome. Um, so Isabel Sawhill, as she's prone to do, told us in the New York Times recently, if we could turn back the marriage clock to 1970, before the sharp rise in divorce and single parenthood began, the child poverty rate would be 20% lower than it is now. I have no idea where she gets these numbers from, by the way. I'm not watching for that. Even some of our biggest social problems, programs like food stamps, do not reduce child poverty as much as unmarried parenthood has increased it. So I took the bait and asked Isabel's question, and we simulated what would happen if we had the 1970 or even the 1980 prevalences that Isabel wants us to have. Okay, what do you find? All four, on both of these counterfactual comparisons, poverty would be worse. Okay, and the reason, it's true, single motherhood has gotten worse between 1970 and 2010. It's gotten worse between 1980 and 2010. The problem with our counterfactual here is that all the other prevalences have gotten better. Okay, we have less low education in 2010 than we had in 1970 or 1980. We have less young headship, a lot less young headship. We have less unemployment in 2010 than we had in 1980 or 1970, even though 2010 is still part of the Great Recession. Okay? So we simulate, what if you move the prevalences for all four risks, and you see in both 1970 on top, and 1980 on the bottom, and the red bar is the predicted poverty in 2010, you see that things would be worse. Okay? So despite what Sawhill says, if we turn back the clock on any of these four demographic risks, things would not be better. The one exception is, if we went back to 1970 marriage dynamics, or family structures, if you will, with all the good things that went with that, it's true. Poverty would be a tiny bit smaller than it was in 2010. Okay, so I, I don't find Saw Hill's counterfactuals terribly persuasive. Okay, so I've argued there's more variation in penalties than prevalences. I've argued that penalties are more important. A logical next question would be, but if penalties were lower, wouldn't prevalences increase? Isn't it reasonable to infer that that high penalty attached to single motherhood is one of the strong incentives you have to not be a single mother, right? You get an education because you know if you don't get an education, you're gonna be poor, right? That's a perfectly reasonable, rational decision-making process. So we could worry, if we reduce those penalties, are we gonna see an increase in prevalences? Is there gonna be a, a, dis, a strong incentive or a lack of incentive to marry or a lack of incentive to finish your degree? So we ask the question of like, do these high penalties discourage high prevalences, okay? And this might lead one to conclude that high penalties are a good thing. We want people to finish schooling. We, on some level, want people to get married. We want them to delay parenthood until they're a little bit more economically secure, and so forth. And as I said, a lot of the research coming out of the fragile families tradition has been asking that exact question. What can we do to discourage people from having children before wedlock and before they're economically secure and able to do so, okay? So we tested this. We looked at the cross-national variation, again, not causal, and we asked ourselves, what's the association between prevalences and penalties? If penalties are a disincentive, incentive, you should see a strong negative association. As penalties go up, prevalences should go down. Okay, that's what we should expect if penalties work as a disincentive. So let's look at each of the four demographic risks and see what we find. Okay, first of all, with single motherhood, here's the bivariate correlation at the macro level. I'm not sure. Uh, I might have to ask Paul. Statistically, it is possible you could have a smaller correlation. I'm not sure. <laughs> Hold that thought. Um, but that's a pretty weak correlation, 0.01. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, so there's no strong evidence, at least with single motherhood, that a higher penalty is reducing the prevalence. I don't see any evidence of that, okay? This is simply a macro correlation, so that's not causal or anything like that. So what we did was we also estimated a multi-level model. Where we pooled the 29 countries together, we treated the penalty as a country-level variable, and the inference would be that, look, where the penalty is higher, 
the odds that somebody's going to be in a single mother hole should be lower. This should be a level two variable with significant negative effects. So we tested that too, multi-level linear probability model, predicting individuals whether or not they're in a single mother hole, so adjusting for all the other variables in the model, and we find no association. The z-score is minus 0.02. Again, I guess statistically it could be smaller, but you know, it's not very big at all, okay? So let's look at the other four demographic risks, okay? For young headship, we oddly find a positive correlation. So as the penalty for young headship gets bigger, people are more likely to be young-headed households. So I don't know what that means. All right, we also tested a multi-level model. Again, we find an insignificant association. There's no association between the penalty for young headship and your odds of being in a young-headed household. Okay. For low education, there's a slight negative association. Okay, it does seem to be in places like the United States where the penalty for low education is really, really high. There's less low educated people than in countries like Spain and Italy where the penalty isn't quite as severe. There might be some rational incentives going on there. We tested this as well in the multi-level model. We don't find a significant association. So there's, that's the strongest evidence. And again, for unemployment, I was wrong. It's actually true. You can get a smaller correlation than we saw with single mother. So that's minus 0 0.005. It actually is statistically possible. Um, I don't know what chance means when you get to a correlation of 0 0.005, but it's basically zero, all right? And again, we find no pattern here that suggests that as a penalty for unemployment gets higher, you have less unemployment. That's just not what drives unemployment. So it's not the case, at least in our evidence, we find no evidence that a higher penalty results in a lower prevalence of these demographic risks. And the model says, says the same thing. Okay, all right. So at this point I've said penalties are the most important thing. Prevalences don't are related to penalties in a logical way. So the reasonable next question is if penalties are so important, what explains the cross-national variation of these penalties? What can countries do to reduce the penalties attached to these demographic risks if, in fact, the problem is these big penalties attached to certain demographic risks in places like the United States. So what we do is now is we, we pool all these 29 countries together, all right, and we estimate multi-level linear probability models, all right, and at this point we basically, we take 3,620 people from each of these different 29 samples. And the reason to do that is to make sure we're not weighting the sample, the pooled sample, by the number of, the size of the samples that we we're working with. So each country is equally represented. And so across the 29 countries, about 100,000 cases. And we estimate random intercept models with robust standard errors. And we allow each of the demographic risks to be a random coefficient. We sort of say we're allowing the penalty to attach to each of these demographic risks to vary across countries. And then we have one cross-level interaction. So we include one very simple measure at the country level to see if this can predict it. And this variable is what I call the transfer share. And what this is, is the mean percent of household income in a country that comes from government transfer. Okay, so if you live in a country where half of your income is coming from government transfers, in a paper that we just had uh, conditionally accepted at ASR, we showed that this predicts poverty pretty well. Okay? In countries where a higher share of household income comes from government transfers, you tend to have less poverty. In the paper we talk about why this is. But this is a very crude, very simple measure of welfare generosity. So we look at the mean of the percent of household income coming from government transfers, we convert it to z-scores just to make the coefficients a little bit more important. So the logic very simply is across five different models, we're going to include a random intercept, so we're going to allow that intercept to vary across countries, and then we're going to take each one of these demographic risks and we're going to say, let's allow that to vary across countries, and let's see if welfare generosity predicts that slope. Okay, that's all we're doing. Very simple. All right? And again, please interrupt me if there's a question about just how we did it. All right, so first you see the random intercept model, and this pools the 29 countries together, and it's sort of interesting. We can look at those penalties across the 29 countries at this point. So you see, for example, being an unemployed household across these 29 countries increases your probability of poverty by about 0.27, and that is the biggest penalty of the demographic risk. The penalty for single motherhood is the smallest despite all the attention in American poverty research. Kind of young and head is second and low education's in between there. Now our measure of welfare generosity, which isn't the gold standard of measuring welfare generosity, this does have a significant association on that random intercept, but it is smaller than demographic risk. So I'll save the demographic risk explanation by saying it's true. These have a bigger effect, quote unquote, on poverty than welfare generosity, net of these individual characteristics. So demographic risks do matter, I wouldn't deny that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow the slope for unemployment to vary across countries and we're going to estimate a cross-level interaction. And what we find is that there's still a main effect of unemployment here, 
there's a main effect of transfer share, but the slope for unemployment becomes significantly uh, weaker as we interact it with welfare generosity. So in other words, in a more generous welfare state, the penalty attached to unemployment is weaker, okay? Now this is also true for low education, okay? In a more generous welfare state, there's less of a penalty attached to low education, and so that demographic risk is less penalizing in terms of poverty relative to less generous welfare states. Now the cross linear actions for single motherhood are not significant, okay? So it's not the gold standard. It's not true that welfare state explains all. All right, so that's not significantly varying. And it's also true across young headship, it's not quite as significant. We only have 29 countries, okay? It's a very simple descriptive comparison, but at least there's some evidence that two of the penalties do vary systematically relative to the generosity of the welfare state. Okay? Okay, so moving on with that. All right, so let me summarize some of the main arguments from today's talk. Okay. First of all, we try to develop prevalences and penalties as a framework for understanding the demographic risks of harm. Okay? We have argued that there are really four paramount demographic risks. I think there's consensus in the literature on this. I think we can agree as poverty scholars that these are the four risks that we should be paying the most attention to. Okay? Now, it's reasonable to ask. I think it's sort of an interesting thought problem. Imagine an instrument that did exist, even though I'm very, very skeptical of efforts to estimate causal effects of these risks across all 29 countries. I would be very skeptical of that. But imagine you had a good instrument, okay? What would happen to these penalties if we could causally estimate that? And it's an interesting thought problem. I'm gonna speculate, without the strongest evidence, that perhaps the variation in penalties might compress a little bit if we had causal estimates. Because perhaps there are unobserved characteristics that are driving selection into these demographic risks and associated with poverty. And perhaps if I had strong causal evidence, I wouldn't observe quite as much variation in the penalties. That's possible, okay? Um, and perhaps those, cause, those effects would be smaller. Nevertheless, um, it's reasonable to suggest we can still reasonably think about demographic risks as carrying both penalties and penalties, and thinking about them distinctively will better help us understand these demographic risks. In future research, I'd like to apply this framework to health. So in the Luxembourg Income Study, we have health data on a whole bunch of these countries. It maybe isn't the best indicators, but we've got disability data, we've got self-rated health and a bunch of these surveys. And it would be interesting to study if in fact there's a lot of variation in prevalences and penalties of these risks for health across the different rich democracies as well. Now we've argued here today that despite much more attention to prevalences and penalties, and I would strongly defend that position. I would say it is true. American poverty research is far, far more interested in prevalences than penalties. Despite that fact, we're going to argue that in many countries, the penalties are insignificant. And that is not a trivial finding, okay? If you condition on or even a reasonable set of observables, you're going to find that the association between some of these demographic risks and poverty is not always going to be significant. Moreover, we show evidence that there's more variation in penalties and prevalences, and we're going to, we're going to conjecture that penalties are more salient than prevalences to the demographic risk of poverty, okay? All right, the next point I would make is to emphasize that despite the fact that the United States has really below average prevalences, and like I said, if you're the kind of scholar that's interested in studying the choices of poor people or asking why do poor people make so many bad choices, why is it that poor people don't get married, why is it poor people have children on wedlock, what you really should be asking yourself is why aren't more Americans doing this? You know, because our prevalences are relatively low. Compared to most countries, relatively few people are making these bad choices and ending up in these demographic risks. Okay? So the United States has high poverty very clearly because of the high penalties, not because of particularly high prevalences. Moreover, we show that historic reductions in prevalences would actually worsen U.S. poverty and not make it better. Okay? We find no evidence that penalties cause prevalences, no evidence that higher disincentives to be in these risks reduces the prevalence of these risks. Okay, and we find some evidence that generous welfare states reduce these pe pe penalties. Okay, so admittedly, it's not rock solid, it's not causal, what have you, but we at least find a little bit of evidence that suggests at least a reasonable hypothesis is that in more generous welfare states, what makes them differ is they don't punish poor people for these demographic risks as much as the United States does. And we would propose that the literature would be in much better shape if it shifted less attention to or attention away from prevalences and put more attention onto these penalties. Okay, and if we're right, if penalties are in fact endogenous 
to social policy, to politics, to institutions, the sorts of arguments we've been trying to make here today, well, that suggests that demographic growth themselves are endogenous to politics. And really, it's a question of politics and social policy and welfare states, and less a question about the choices that individual poor people may or may not make. Okay. Last but not least, I want to make a reference to a really important study that came out a couple of years ago. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with this study by Heinrich Hein and colleagues, all right? This paper was published in 2010. I don't really know the journal, but my friends in psychology tell me it's a very influential journal. And this paper's been cited far over a thousand times in four years. So they did something right, right? They're, they're very influential scholars. And the paper's titled, The Weirdest People in the World, okay? And what they do is they go through and they systematically review. The article's like 50 pages long and there's 30 pages of comments. It's a beast, but it's really interesting, okay? And what they do is they systematically review all of the evidence they can get their hands on in terms of psychological research with laboratory experiments on cognition, on sensory adaptation, moral reasoning, you name it. Everything they can get their hands on. And what they want to know is, are these, these laboratory samples, are they generalizable, okay? And what they show is the vast majority of psychological research has come from weird countries. And what's a weird country? Weird is Western, educated, industrialized, rich democracies. <laughs> and they say, the findings suggest that members of weird societies are among the least representative populations one could find for generalized populations. And they show over and over and over again that something we thought was solid in psychological research, something we thought was universal, doesn't hold up at all if you go outside the weird countries and look at some other samples. Go to a developing country, go to a rural setting, do something different, okay? Moreover, then they go into the studies on the United States alone. They say, well, not only are weird countries weird, okay, but the United States is especially weird. Okay? <laughs> and so, for example, they tell us Americans are, on average, the most individualistic people in the world. Okay? So what we're going to propose today is that, in fact, American poverty research needs this sort of reflection. It needs to think a little bit harder about how weird we are and how unusual we are. Okay? And like I said earlier, the vast majority of American poverty research concentrates only on the United States. Most of this literature I cited by many of the most influential and famous poverty scholars is based on samples only of Americans, often only of highly disadvantaged Americans and especially poor neighborhoods. Right? And my inference would be that if we broke out of this tradition a little bit, and we thought a little bit harder about how unusual in the United States is we might draw different inferences about the role of demographic risk for poverty. So for example, we showed that the United States has unusually high poverty and indeed the biggest penalties for demographic risk. And in this case, I only compared the United States to other weird countries. I don't know what the patterns would look like if I had non-weird countries. I only had weird countries in the sample. All right? And so we're going to conclude with the, the, the conjecture that studies of the demographic risk of poverty in the United States suffer from a very significant, perhaps even severe, sample selection bias. And we need to be far more cautious about the inferences we draw about demographic risk and the attention we pay to demographic risk in American poverty research. Thank you. Questions? I'll take more questions. Okay, go ahead. I do. Hi. Um, so, I'm a comparative welfare state scholar, and I have been for my entire career. Um, so I, I hear this talk with very, very mixed feelings. On the one hand, I think that's fantastic. You know, our focus on the political and policy determinants of penalties associated with demographic characteristics and why they affect poverty rates. Finally, you know, here's a really nice, neat talk that shows why this is important. Our work here is done. I can go home. Okay. On the other I, I, hand, we can stop the question there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling great about midway through your talk. And then it occurs to me, wait a minute. I've been doing this my entire adult life, and clearly nobody is listening. So I guess what I want to challenge you to do is to tell me, are, are you totally underplaying the influence of this body of scholarship? Or um, and are people like me who do this kind of work not working nearly hard enough to communicate our findings to the rest of the world? Um, 
That's a great question. Uh, certainly not what you just said, but um, I'll have a slightly different take on this theory of time too. Yeah. Um, so we often, when we fr get frustrated with the impact our scholarship have, I think it's almost a natural reaction. Maybe a very American individualist or <laughs> suggests the failure is us. If I would have just worked harder, if I would have communicated better, if I wrote better, they, you know, these policymakers would be listening. You know, and I don't really think that's how knowledge affects policy. I don't think that's how ideas affect knowledge necessarily. We have to think more about the audience, okay? And we need to think about who's doing American poverty research. And my question would be the other way around. What more does one need to do to get American poverty researchers to pay attention to this vast body of cross-national social policy research that's been going on forever? Believe me, you're preaching the choir. Um, what I would say on that is that, so I, I'm just finishing, hopefully soon, finishing this, this beast of a handbook, and I have three inferences I can draw about uh, social sciences of poverty. One is that, as you know, sociologists are always mad at economists because they don't cite us. We're always grumpy about that. So it's true, economists don't cite sociologists. All our econ chapters, they didn't cite anybody but econ, okay? And it's true, for the most part, political scientists don't study poverty at all. So that would be a problem, is that they're not actually studying poverty. But sociologists, you could say, they don't cite any other country. Okay? So American sociologists, in chapter after chapter that was coming in, with the exception of, where's Emily? She's the one exception. She has to have <laughs> She cites other countries. Okay. But American sociologists are just kind of like, don't bother to even cite any studies done in any other country in these handbook chapters that we're getting in. And we had to send it back to them and say, come on, man, you know, cite a European, somebody, England, Canada, something. Uh, and so the dilemma, I think, is that American poverty research exists within sort of a bubble where the U.S. is sufficient. U.S. is enough of a case, it's the universal case, it's the true case. Um, and I think that's the dilemma, is that the audience, the practitioners, the poverty scholarship, need to read at least an ounce of uh, cross-national social policy research. I, you know, I don't have grand delusions about my capacity to, ch to change that. We've got handbooks on that, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead, Grace. Okay, so I just really, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. So is Steve, is Heine, Steve Heine? Because if so, he's my friend. So that's one thing. <laughs> he used to be a pen. So They're in that, British Columbia, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. Steve. Great. Okay, so I have two quick questions that are not challenges at all, but maybe just things that you could maybe help me with. So one is, if I were one of the culture people, and I'm not, but I could say that your four sort of strongmen, so to speak, they're not quite equivalent. Because I choose, I could, you could say I choose to have a baby out of wedlock. You know, okay, we can argue with that. But mm -hmm. some things are sort of, you could argue, are choices. But being unemployed is not really the same kind of thing. It's something that's, that happens to me. So that's sort of, you know, if I were one of the culture people, I might push you a little bit on that. Okay. The me, second can thing, I just, oh, okay, yeah, sure. let's stick with this one just so okay, I can sure. understand it clearly. Sure. So is the inference, I don't, I don't quite understand the argument, is that they would, are, we should be fair and say they would not suggest all of these risks are driven by culture. Is that what Our you're claiming? Individual choice. Okay. Because right. they were sort of make, making the statement okay. that the poverty people were saying, you know, all these things are individual choice, and then you had four things, but I really think one of the four, it's hard to argue that that's, okay. you know, and I'm not, I'm not making the argument. I, actually um, don't I don't want to cut you argument. off at all, Grace, yeah. but like, let's just think about that for a second. Um, so what are the culture people saying? I mean, let's be clear, they are saying educational aspirations, yeah. which plausibly affect your employment probability. But that's see, they see, I mean, most of okay. social ed people would not he's say. Mind. Okay, I'm <laughs> yeah. I would no, say I mean, he's not. You can look at their text. I've read that work very closely. So here's their text. I mean, are they really not saying that culture causes, okay, demographic risks? I mean, I don't know. Let's see what they say. So Small and colleagues tell us that, you know, we're not saying, they want to distinguish frames from values, means end, but rather than causing behavior, frames make it possible or likely. Are we splitting hairs to say they're not causing demographic risks? I mean, I don't know. Well, I'm I mean, just talking about unemployment. Okay, but if you fail to invest in education, uh, whether it's... But then that's an culture. additive argument, right? And then the thing you showed us at the beginning okay, before okay. separate... That's but, I mean, is I'm it... Not, is it not, is I don't it, want to make the argument. No, 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 this is... I thought, <laughs> I no, I, I, I'm, I'm taking the bait because the um, I've thought a lot about this. So, I mean, I think this is a fair debate. I mean, are they saying culture causes demographic risk? That's a fair question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't do this kind of work, but I think you can ask yourself that. I mean, they, they have spent a lot of attention focused on uh, non-cognitive skills. They've uh, Work ethic has been an important theme. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. That's a fair, and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer your question by saying I don't know. I read their text pretty carefully. It seems to me they're suggesting poor people's behaviors are driven by culture. So we can argue about causality. Maybe, let me be a little clearer then. Yeah. You think about it just 
forget them for a second. Okay. Just think about four <laughs> four things. They're okay. not to me. They're not equivalent kinds okay. of things. Okay. That's, I guess that's maybe that's like. I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that yeah, and I think the evidence shows the demographic risk. The penalty attached to unemployment is more universal. Yeah. I mean, it's more high in all countries. It is. Uh, there's less variation. Thanks, sir. Um, there's there's less variation across the country, so it does seem to be the biggest penalty in most countries. So second question, yes, just please. clarification. He didn't say anything about race and yeah. just immigrants, yes. and you know I think these countries vary a lot. Like it's hard to compare Japan really yeah. with the yeah. U.S. Yeah. I know some of these countries have more immigrants now, and yeah. you know in the U.S. of course blacks have you know more than twice the poverty rate, you know all this stuff. So yeah, yeah. Where so, does that come in? That's a good question. So I would say. Um, so I guess I'm old enough now I can say there are things where you've invested a lot of time and you've gotten product out of it as a scholar. There are things you invested a little bit of time in and gotten a product out of. And there are things invested a lot of time in and gotten nothing out of it. And that's been my attempts to think about race and poverty and the cross-national data. I thought really hard about this. I've looked at the data a lot. It's really hard to do anything with that. And I'll say a couple things on this. One is that I think, I, I, I would make the conjecture that um, the racial subjugation of African Americans is not comparable with any other race and ethnic dynamic across these rich democracies. So there isn't well, something I can... Israel is... Yeah. 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 I, don't think, I don't think... I mean, I'm not saying it's worse or better. I'm just going to say I don't think it's comparable. Uh, you know, centuries of slavery and racism, I just don't know if we have an index of that we can think about comparatively. It's a very distinctive thing, okay? So one, it's really hard to translate our thinking about racial stratification, racial subjugation into a comparative framework. This is really hard, okay? Secondly, I would say, in some of these countries we have to do have immigration data. I, I guess the danger would be that there's something, some unobserved characteristic in racial stratification that's correlated perhaps with these demographic risks and poverty. I'm trying to think about, I mean, maybe you can help me think about it, trying to think about what that would mean for our inferences. Would that mean that, again, if we had better causal estimates of these penalties, yeah, maybe maybe that would change our interpretation a little bit. But it, but I have to punt. And the reason is you just can't do it. I can do stuff with immigration, um, but I can't do anything else in the list data. And I can't do it for all the countries. So it's going to be dissatisfying. Are we running out of time? We are. Oh, um, uh, the Social Science and Policy Forum goes an hour and a half. Sociology goes an hour. Okay. Um, given that we're on sociology turf, uh, <laughs> we should respect the frames and the values of the department <laughs> and let people go. But I think we can continue to have okay. so I'm having discussion. Start. And then David's also going to be meeting with sociology graduates for lunch. Oh, so maybe yeah. pause and then I'll say oh, oh, Yeah, that's fine. So thank you. Uh, if, you want to, if, you, if you don't want to rush right now, uh, David's here.